Well, um, welcome everybody. Glad to see so many of you joining and still many kind of uh, just, just uh, dialing in as we begin this, uh, it, which is the first of um, a series of six webinars that uh, Anglian Water are bringing to you in, in association with Land Management 2.0. Um, I'm Andy Brown, I'm the Head of Sustainability with Anglian Water and, and I'm just going to be part of the kind of compare for you this evening. Um, and we're going to have some fantastic presentations by a couple of speakers and then the opportunity to have some really uh, insightful uh, Q&A, hopefully. Um, so, yes, just want to say a quick thank you to, to Tim uh, from Land Management 2.0, but also to Richard Reynolds, who's uh, Anglian Waters uh, Senior uh, Agronomy Advisor, who's put this programme together. And really the, the whole purpose of this webinar series is to explore what future uh, of land management in the East of England could look like. Um, how can land managers build sustainable, profitable and resilient businesses moving forward? Um, and tonight's um, first uh, webinar is, is really looking at how we can support farming businesses into the future. So we've got, a, as I say, a couple of fantastic presentations from, uh, from Peter, the CEO of Anglian Water, um, who's going to talk a, a bit about the kind of uh, the challenges that, that we face as a company and, and what that is um, developing into and the opportunities that arise with our two sectors working together. Uh, and then Oliver from, from Barclays um, bringing his kind of expertise into this as well, which will be fantastic. Uh, and really this, this kind of this seminar or these group of seminars is, is much more than just having some one-off conversations and some presentations and a little bit of, of kind of one-way learning. For, for us, this is about kind of Yes, having some learning, but then creating a network and hopefully really delivering some, some support and some action going on beyond that. And I think Tim will possibly touch on that in a minute. Um, and so that's really all I want to say to kind of kick it off. I'll be joining you again after the speakers and, and I'll be chairing the Q&A. Tim's going to tell you how to get your questions um, to us and, and please to make this as, as kind of insightful and as useful as possible. Please do kind of give your questions to us and then I can put those uh, to, to Peter and Oliver at the end of the session. So, Tim, over to you. Oh, great, thank you, Andy. Well, welcome everybody. Um, so my name is Tim Hopkin. I'm the founder of the Land App and Land Management 2.0, and I'm currently back on our family farm, which is just south of Guildford in Surrey. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you here today as we get off this next webinar series. And as Andy said, you know, this is really starting a movement. Yes, it's a webinar series. Yes, it's to engage conversation, but really this is, a, is the start of a movement in the East of England, as we really look to see how we can support farmers and the land management sector to really, you know, build these resilient business models going forward into the future. So as Andy said, we've also got an online course, which we're gonna be building, which will be released after the end of this series. Um, and we have an online community, which is gonna be live next week, so we really look forward to your engagement and participation in that. Um, so yeah, once again, thank you for joining. It's a real pleasure to be with you here today and I look forward to the ongoing conversation. So our first speaker today is Peter Simpson, the CEO of Anglian Water. And Anglian Water really are putting a stake in the ground to support the land management sector in the East of England. So Peter, I will hand over to you to start sharing your screen and your slides and um, yeah. In looking forward to the presentation. Peter, over to you. Thanks very much indeed, Tim. Appreciate that. Um, I was looking at the slide of the, the picture of me right at the beginning of this and then looking at the picture of me currently in, in Zoom and thinking I've aged a bit in the last few years, but I'm sure that's uh, true, for, true for all of us, particularly this last year. Um, so I've got about 15 minutes to rattle through an awful lot of slides, um, so I'll, I'll get straight into it. I suppose the first thing I, I wanted to do is just a, a very quick bit about Anglian Water and some of the challenges we're facing. Um, the relevance of that really is to say, to set into context how we've gone about um, addressing those challenges, how we thought about it, how we planned or how we built business plans around our response to that, which might be, might be useful for you. And then perhaps most importantly, to talk about um, areas where I think there's opportunities to work together, collaborate, and uh, what some of those things are. So that's kind of the the idea of the presentation. So if I kick off with just a little bit about Anglian, uh, we have to be, everybody has to be the biggest at something. We're geographically the largest water company serving a population of uh, just under 7 million uh, across the east of England. And we also own a Hartlepool Water, as a little fact you might not, uh, not, might not know. 
more important than all of that is we're facing some really big challenges and they're driven principally by the impact of climate change and growth, growth in housing. In the next five years alone, uh, 175,000 houses are destined for our region um, and they're all competing uh, in, in the environment. And that, that building resilience uh, is a really important part of our response to uh, not only the impact of climate change, but also uh, the impact of that housing growth. So on the right hand side, you've got some statements from our strategic direction statement, which is a 25 year picture of what we need to do as a business. And many of the things that we have to do have to be planned, not only in the short and medium, but also in the very long term, uh, as I'll come to later. Now, I apologize for this, this horrible slide. Um, there won't be any tests on this later. It is on our website if you're interested in it. I suppose what it's trying to do is to bring to life the fact that on the left hand side uh, highlights some of the challenges and pressures facing us as a company and indeed us as an industry. Um, and some of those you, you'll recognize and some of them will be very common to the challenges that you're facing. And then as you go from left to right and on the right hand side you'll see those statements I talked about earlier, the strategic direction that we've set ourselves, the process from left to right goes that we go through is actually how we organize our business, the things that we do to organize our resources to try and deliver on those objectives on the right hand side. And there's lots of stuff in there, but some of the things that you might not expect us to be doing uh, as a company is focusing on uh, the capitals, the six capitals in our decision making. And I'll give some examples later, but it really is quite different to when I joined the company 30 odd, 32 years ago, um, in terms of how we go about deciding what we're going to invest in. It isn't the same things as it was uh, three decades ago. It's very, very different. And it does reflect the fact that we're under an awful lot of pressure in this part of the world. So that's a model that we use. Um, you'll see it ties into the sustainable development goals. You'll see that in the middle of it, there's something called a, a wheel, an outcomes wheel. And, and that uh, engenders one of the really important principle for Anglian, which is the idea of co-creation. And these outcomes were co-created with our customers um, and they're what our customers hold us to account for. And so there's rafts and rafts of measurements around each one of those, but they're things that our customers have told us are important and they, uh, they hold us to account against those. So if I just kind of bring it down to bring it down to earth, you know, some of the real challenges that we face are, are not only in the long term and medium term, they're in the very short term in, in the next few years. And the most fundamental one is actually the avail availability of water. And for us, we are losing water as a result of a few things. Uh, we've got uh, licenses being taken away from the company uh, under the Environment Agency Sustainable Reduction Programme. Um, and that's really about uh, trying to ensure the environment has the water it needs for the future. We've got uh, capacity being taken away as a result of that housing growth. We've got the need to build more drought resilience and we've got the impact of climate change over and above all of that. The net result of it means that if you look at that, um, that graph, if we did nothing, then by 2025, essentially we're getting to a place where the amount of water we've got and the demand for water are, are, are kind of overlapping. So there's a real risk that in some parts of the region, uh, we could be struggling for water supply. Now, obviously that's not a situation we are planning to get into. And there's an enormous uh, program of work going on now on the supply side and the demand side. The supply side, we're laying a 500 kilometer pipeline from uh, North Lincolnshire right the way down to the Southeast and into Essex. Um, and that's going to be interconnected with virtually all of our existing water systems to give us a lot of flexibility. Um, and also we're doing a lot of work on the demand side, reducing leakage and rolling out a million smart meters amongst other things. So there's a lot going on, but if we weren't to do those things, then this is the picture that we would see. Um, essentially, this is the picture before we make any of those interventions and we make that investment. And uh, that investment is really considerable in total. It's about 850 million pounds worth of, of work. Um, without it, um, you'd pretty much only be okay if you're in East Lincolnshire, South Lincolnshire, 
a um, bit of West Norfolk, uh, and then right the way down near Sudbury. Otherwise, uh, you're in difficulty. So this is a public water supply perspective. Now, one of the things that we've discovered over the years is the, is the blindingly obvious thing, which is that our, our fates are intertwined. Water doesn't really care where it goes. Uh, we've all got demands for water. Agriculture's got demands, public water supply, um, energy, power. Uh, lots of different sectors have got demands for water. And that's one of the reasons that we founded Water Resources East, which many of you will be aware of, which is this first uh, approach of multi-sector water water planning, where everybody's demands for water are put into the pot and we try and understand the best way to manage and develop water plans for the future. Um, but also uh, right down at sort of grassroots, the very close collaboration we've had with farmers has enabled us to tackle some really big challenges. So one of them uh, it was uh, metaldehyde um, that we cannot treat uh, in most of our uh, water treatment works. Um, and as a result of a, a, an exercise over several years, using our specialist um, agricultural advisors in Anglin, working closely with farmers, you know, we have managed collectively to essentially eliminate it from um, uh, being an issue for Anglian and eliminating it from the treated water we, we supply. So that's really important. It's been done. It's been done through catchment management. Um, and um, it's an impressive achievement. It shows what can be done. And I think there are about 2,000 farmers involved in that particular trial. So some really impressive, um, impressive performance. And it shows just what we can do when we do get together and collaborate rather than just saying it's their fault, it's our fault, it's somebody else's fault. You know, OK, it is what it is. What can we do about it together? Um, and working in partnership um, is definitely uh, important to virtually all of the outcomes we need to achieve as a business. Um, I guess this slide is just trying to reinforce that we're working with lots of people. Um, what, what I hope comes across in, in some of the things I'm saying is that our, our, our collective futures are intertwined. They're intertwined not just in terms of the availability of water, but also in terms of the quality of water. And if you think about that comment I made earlier about that big pipeline that's going from the north right the way down to the southeast, you can see it's no longer about local impacts of water. It's actually about a regional impacts of water, not just supply, but also quality. So, you know, the impact that farming has on raw water and what we do um, is, is really important for us to be working together on. So um, increasingly, we're using those frameworks I talked about earlier, uh, where we're looking at six capitals and uh, particularly in this case, natural capital to think about um, the decisions we take. And in the, the middle picture there is actually uh, near Inglesthorpe in uh, West Norfolk. Um, it was, uh, that's an early picture actually, that was a treatment, it is a treatment wetland which is, looks quite different now. I think that was taken a matter of a few months after it was commissioned. Um, but what we've done there is rather than building energy intensive, carbon intensive treatment processes, we've put in place a treatment wetland which has not only reduced cost, it's reduced carbon, and it's really, really created a, a natural habitat and massively increased biodiversity on what is a natural uh, chalk fed river uh, and habitat. And uh, it, it's an example of where we go as a business. And, and if I took that particular one, we've got about 300 million pounds of similar type investments to make over the next few years. And, and I think we've got something like 34 of these treatment wetlands are like this to put in across the company. It's a very different approach to one that you might have associated with us a few years ago. It's very different to building concrete, putting in pumps, putting in pipes, all the things you might associate with a water company. Uh, we're moving into a very different place. I guess the key thing for me though is this only works when we're in partnership. This only worked because we had a relationship with the local farmer and they were engaged in this just as much and perhaps not even, even more than we were. Um, so we need we need to think about these opportunities as we, as we go go forwards because there are there are plenty of them and the six capitals thinking is certainly taking us down down that down that route and the east of England certainly does have a real need for you know increasing uh, biodiversity and there are there are opportunities there. 
Um, I wanted to give this as a bit of an example of, is this a risk or opportunity? So a lot of the conversations that go on around a change in climate and loss of biodiversity all become sort of woe is us. You know, it's, it's really, you know, it's, it's awful. You know, it's all being done to us. You know, what, what can we do about it? Well, I think we can do a lot. And I don't think we have to think of it all in risk terms. I think we can think of it in terms of opportunities. So Anglian got this on carbon many, many years ago. And um, to give an example, in um, about 2010, we decided, to, because we were such a big user of power, that and because we were so vulnerable to the impact of a changing climate, being in a you know, water scarce area in the east of England, low lying, all the things you know, um, we thought we, have, we really have to show some leadership here. And the first thing that people said was, if you want to reduce the carbon in things you build, it's going to cost you more money. And we said, no, we're going to go, we're going to, we set ourselves ambition at that time, we're going to halve the carbon in everything we're building, and we're going to take 20% of the cost out. So we're going to reduce carbon, and we're going to reduce cost. Now, the message from, from that is, uh, we, we've, since 2010 to today, we've reduced the carbon in everything we build by 61%. It's actually 62% um, as I'm speaking to you now. Um, and we've taken uh, well over 20% of the cost out. How? Well, because we've unlocked innovation and we've unlocked a, a much deeper level of collaboration with our, with our supply chain. And we've bought in new solutions, new natural capital solutions, and all of those things have enabled us to achieve it. So it's been an opportunity as opposed to a risk. You know, and it's enabled you know, us as a company to save, to save money. And we've used that and shared that, um, that leadership that we showed there much more widely. And in fact, the entire water industry now has set itself on a mission to net zero by 2030, which is driving an awful lot of collaboration and, and innovation and opportunity, perhaps for farming, which I, which I will come back to. Other opportunities, I mean, here's another example um, Europe at the time uh, stopped lending money to water companies, the European Investment Bank, um, and it used to be a place where you could get very low, uh, very good value finance. Uh, when that went, at the time we thought it was going and it was closing down, we thought what else can we do? And essentially what we did was we used those credentials and that measurement that we've got for our reducing carbon to go and launch green bonds at the London Stock Exchange, and we were the first organisation uh, in Europe to do this, uh, first utility in Europe to do this. And this was fantastic. It, um, we've raised nearly a billion pounds or over a billion pounds now of funding through green finance at low rates, at rates that were lower than we were getting with the EIB. So again, carbon risk or opportunity. Well, in this case, real opportunity, you know, do it, you know, getting, getting it financed, getting finance at a much lower rate because we can demonstrate those carbon credentials. So where does it all go next and where are some further opportunities? Well, we're doing a lot of work and have been for many years actually on what, what's the natural capital of the east of England and, and how can we as a company demonstrate that we're making improvements to that? And, and in fact, we've set ourselves the ambition that every single capital scheme we do has to have at least a 10% biodiversity net gain by way of an example. But we also did a lot of work baselining it, you know, and we did this with uh, the Centre for Water Studies, um, which is part of the University of East Anglia, um, in order to sort of understand that over time, what sort of impact we were having. But what became really clear to us at the time was, it's no good just focusing on one thing. It's no just good focusing on biodiversity. It's no good just focusing on carbon. We've got to try and pull these things together. And that's where the opportunity to do some really exciting things came in. So what about if we began to combine the opportunities for offsetting and sequestering carbon with the opportunities to increase uh, natural capital, increase biodiversity, increase habitats? And the very latest thing uh, that we're involved in is looking at trying to create a market for offsetting not only carbon and sequestering carbon, but also uh, for uh, looking at increasing that biodiversity. And it's interesting that that water uk piece i said earlier so the whole water industry is committed to net zero by 2030 we know today that there's still a residual amount that we can't do um, about 13 percent or so of our carbon footprint we can't cover off so we're going to have to offset that somewhere what we'd like to do is inset it we'd like to not 
do something in Brazil or anywhere else. We'd like to do something locally. And Anglian would like to do something in the east of England. But we don't want to do just that. We'd like to do um, uh, carbon offsetting and um, what we can do to actually enhance uh, biodiversity and habitats. And an interesting fact that we came across in doing this work just on carbon is that a 1% increase in soil carbon across 1.5% of, of our regions, just our regions, enclosed farmland, could satisfy the offsetting needs of the entire water sector, uh, which is about some 900,000 tonnes, if it's done in the right way and if it's sustainable. So some really good opportunities. We're doing a lot of work with uh, David Hill, chairman and owner of the Environmental Bank and advisor to the government, um, but it's just kicked off that one. And I guess the last, the last thing I'll say is there's an invitation there for anybody who's interested in coming on this, this journey with us, please do get involved. There's an awful lot that we think we need to learn on this journey, you know, how this is gonna fit with Elms, um, how we actually get the right price between these things, how we can genuinely create the market for particularly the biodiversity um, uh, offset side of things. So I think there's a lot of opportunity and I think very shortly um, the supply for these will, will uh, be, be completely swamped by the demand. And there's an opportunity there for uh, organizations who wanna get ahead of this to get ahead. Um, so hopefully there's an, enough in there uh, to have seeded some thoughts and uh, particularly for thinking about your own plans or perhaps for the Q&A later on. Thank you. Peter, thank you. That was as fascinating as I thought it might be. So what an incredible way to start the series and just incredible to hear what Anglian Water are up to. You know, there's just so many ongoing projects that hopefully a lot of people can get involved in. So thank you for teeing us up so, so well. Um, so everybody, I'm going to send through into the chat function, um, if I can find the chat function, the, uh, the Q&A, this, oh, there we go, I'm going to send this through to everybody. So this link here will bring you through into Slido. For those that have got smartphones that can read QR codes, you can also uh, look at the QR code in the top left hand panel with your, there you go. Okay, so the question is, what would help land managers to build more resilient business models over the next seven years? Funding, I had a feeling funding might come up as a starter. Anything else? And I will we'll probably have about 20 or 30 seconds on each of these. Knowledge, advice, education, training, funding, certainty. Thank you. Yes, yeah, certainty. Two people with certainty. Collaboration. Technical support. Understanding the natural capital value of land. Natural capital knowledge. Funding certainty in capital letters. Yes, I'm... <laughs> Funding, knowledge, support, training, advice, collaboration, jumping out, energy efficiency. Great. Better data collection, water sustainability, knowledge exchange, fairness, diversity. Brilliant. I will give you guys another 10 seconds just to do that. Thank you for being so prompt on getting the answers in. This is brilliant. <laughs> Much quicker than it was last year. Great. All right, fantastic. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to stop that. I think we've got a very strong picture of what the point is there. That's brilliant. So I'm going to stop that. I'm going to go on to the next question, set that live, see if I can send it through a little bit quicker than I could last time. So next link coming through right now. And again, do use your phone to use the QR reader. What are the biggest concerns for land managers over the next seven years? So Climate change, politicians, loss of BPS, climate change. And I suspect in the east of England, this is particularly relevant. Um, market certainty, yeah, loss of BPS, climate change, ag bill, drought, soil fertility, the goalposts, exclamation mark, where are they? <laughs> Question mark. Um, income certainty, funding elms, affordability, changes in government, politicians again. Business viability, sea level rise, linked to climate change. Okay, really interesting. Yeah, climate change, wow, I can't believe this is quite so prominent, that is quite scary. Um, funding in capital letters now, soil fertility, commodity prices, climate change, brilliant water availability, poorly designed biodiversity projects, yeah, very interesting. Again, this is all part of what we hope to be supporting everyone with as we go through this series. So brilliant. I will stop that one, but thank you again. And we're going to go back into uh, ask the next question. Um, 
And let me get this through to everybody. Thank you again for being so prompt, everyone. This is brilliant. Um, so again, you can use the queue, your phone. Which are the most inspiring land management projects in the east of England? So Beaver reintroduction. Might have something to do with Archie. Archie might even be on the call. Anglian Water, great. Okay, interesting. So we really want to start looking at really inspirational projects that are happening throughout the region. We really want to understand what are their underpinning components of success? What are the parts of their models that can be replicable by others? How can we start telling their stories more effectively? Wild East, great. Okay. So lots of them actually. <laughs> Brilliant. Wild East, beaver reintroduction, salt marsh creation. Wild East, okay, wow. Guys, it's summer latent. Wensum, brilliant. Regen Projects, Holcomb, the wonderful Jake Fines, who is going to be chairing the next webinar series next Thursday at 4.30. Um, brilliant Agroforestry, probably a little bit premature, but I will say we are, Agroforestry is going to be our first online course. Rewilding, brilliant. Fantastic, guys. We're just conscious of time. Five o'clock now. So I'm going to stop that and we're going to go back to Oliver. So thank you, everyone. And we'll make all these public afterwards. So thank you, everybody. So our next speaker is Oliver. Um, Oliver is the National Agricultural Strategy Director for Barclays um, and has, has had a life in agriculture and has a world of wisdom about what makes you know, progressive business models on farms. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, there we go. And Oliver, we will hand over to you. And just a reminder to everyone, please do ask your questions in the Q&A function. Um, you know, please ask anything you've got. Please upvote questions. Please, please add comments to them. Um, and we'll get to the Q&A section after Oliver's presentation. So, Oliver, over to you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to uh, Anglian Water for inviting me to speak today. Um, so in, in true style, we are going to have a little bit of the next slide, please, scenario with Tim. Tim, my uh, very glamorous assistant, um, is going gonna, is gonna to move it on for me because um, my technological skills uh, just aren't there, I'm afraid. Um, so. I'm Oliver McIntyre. I'm based in the northwest of England, but with a national role uh, within Barclays. I suppose my job, uh, in, in very simplistic terms, is to uh, explain farming to bankers occasionally, uh, and, and and possibly more frequently explain banking to farmers. Um, so my background is uh, a small family farm in the northwest of England, uh, agricultural college, farm management, consultancy, lending money and uh, finally landed into this job about eight years ago. Um, I'm not going to do too much of an intro uh, to the East Anglian region about Barclays because it is actually our heartland and motherland, so you should know all about us. But uh, we'll just talk about three of the things uh, I'm going to cover today. Um, I suppose really, and it's just come up on those uh, amazing work clouds, they're fantastic, um, the impact of the transition period, uh, other pressures uh, on a global basis on UK agriculture and just the future management and, and bank lending. So if we uh, push a slide along, Tim, that would be handy. Um, I suppose the starting point of the bank is always going to be debt uh, and debt levels. Uh, these are Bank of England figures. So this is to the whole of agriculture, not just Barclays figures. Um, about 19 and a quarter billion pounds worth of drawn debt in the UK industry uh, as of the end of December. Uh, set that against about 10, 10 and three quarter billion of credit balances. Um, so debt balances are up. They're only up two and a half percent. We haven't seen too bad uh, prices in the commodities. Doesn't matter whether that's uh, wheat, whether it's uh, milk, uh, lamb, crikey, lamb's bouncing on at the minute, uh, beef, uh, et cetera, et cetera. For that sort of 2020 trading year, although there was the odd challenge through COVID, but for the most part, we would expect those debt balances to be year on year increase between sort of five and 10 percent, depending on what's happening. I think the reason they haven't gone up is, uh, uh, as came up on the work cloud, there's a lack of clarity about future direction. 
there are uh, certainly confusion and questions, and of course, perhaps one of the biggest ones, uh, whether we were going to get a deal or not with the EU. And as a result of that, you can also see that credit balances are up a massive 18% as people kind of stuck hold of their money, perhaps, uh, if they were fortunate enough to be making a profit. And, you know, overall, I expect the position now we've got a bit more clarity on domestic ag policy. We've got a, a tariff free deal, uh, even if there are port complications uh, with the EU. I expect that sort of credit balance figure to drop back in the coming year and the debt demand uh, perhaps to increase a little. One quick, uh, quick and easy way of working out uh, the sort of health, if you will, of UK agriculture as a whole is to take that uh, debit balance, the debt out to the industry and take away the credit balances. If we do that to uh, the end of December 2019, um, it was just shy of 10 billion uh, in round figures on a, fr on a Friday, on a Thursday afternoon at Gone Five. Um, it, at the end of December 2020, it sat at about eight and a half billion. That's a drop of 14.9%. So in other words, the, the net debt position of agriculture during 2020 actually reduced by just about 1.5% billion pounds. There is a reason for going on about this because that sits against an asset base, depending on who you read and, and which article you look at, anywhere between 250 and 300 billion in land and buildings. That's before we look at crops in store, crops in the ground, livestock, tractors after HP or anything like that. So effectively, while we sit with that sort of um, eight, eight and a half billion of debt, net debt across the industry, that sat against, say, 250, 300 billion of assets. So an overall net leverage position of about 3 to 4%. So I suppose the point of this slide is to emphasize as an industry, as long as that investment is sustainable, can be serviced, and is prudent, then you know it's in a hugely great position uh, to come out and borrow money for those sustainable, uh, serviceable propositions. Um, we've got a lot of change coming up ahead, and the next slide, Tim, will sort of be a very basic graphic uh, for those uh, who want to see that you know we're in a position now where BPS was as was last year, um, but as we move forward through the transition period beyond 2024, which is what we've got clarity on at the minute, right through to 2028, that BPS is going to tail off and in fact disappear. Um, that's going to have an impact on an awful lot of farm businesses up and down the UK. It's going to have an impact in East Anglia also. Obviously, from 2025, we're looking at the introduction of uh, environmental land management, ELMS for short. Uh, and through that time, we've also got to deal with that sort of um, twin pressure, as it were, of uh, climate change. Very serious matter that we, we should be considering. Uh, and also public opinion in, in my what now looks a rather pathetic word crowd, uh, cloud. Thank you, Tim, after your amazing live ones. Um, but, you know, we are looking at sustainability, food miles, cheap food, sustainable food, environment, carbon sequestration has already been mentioned, you know, and there is that sort of vegetarian and uh, vegetarianism and veganism sort of push uh, from some quarters as well. On top of that, we've got the government's own Committee on Climate Change. Um, any of you who have not been on the Committee on Climate Change website, uh, I strongly urge you to put agriculture into the search engine uh, and take a flick through the report that's on there for agriculture. Um, there's some great ideas in there. Uh, there's also going to be some challenges down the road. So what else do we know about the transition period? Well, the next next slide, Tim, is uh, the stark reality of BPS payments. Came up a lot on the word clouds in between Peter and I speaking. Um, you know, the basic gist uh, of, of these reductions that are, um, I was going to say they're set in law till 2024, but uh, we've actually had a conference call uh, earlier this week. And uh, apparently it's not yet, uh, but this year's reductions will be, uh, as will uh, as the years go by, um, the reductions will come in. So the basic gist of these is, is whatever BPS you got last year, um, by the 2024 payment window, it, it's going to be half at best. Um, I think there is a statistic that 80% of the UK's farmers actually receive £30,000 or less. Uh, doesn't sound much money when we're talking about billions uh, in, in common agricultural policy money uh, coming in historically and billions of debt in the industry. Uh, but actually, you know, 15,000 reduction in the space of three years in farm income, if it was a £30,000 BPS, uh, that's quite a hole to fill. 
how are we going to try filling these holes? Well, next slide uh, will show us potentially the impact of some of these. This is DEFRA's farm business survey. Um, the gray box at the top is uh, basic payment scheme income. So uh, clearly with the geography we're talking at today, we're probably looking to the left-hand side of the graph, uh, that's cereals and general cropping. Um, and, you know, the, the dark blue box on the bottom is, is uh, agricultural income. Well, guess what? They fluctuate and change depending on what the markets are doing. Um, so in this example, you can see that specialist pigs uh, actually lost money from their agricultural enterprises. That will probably not be the case uh, when last year's results, this year's farm business survey come out. Um, so there are challenges with that. But if you start to sort of visualize that box being only half as big, um, it's going to be a big impact. And clearly, there's an understanding of that within the audience because BPS reduction removal came up an awful lot of times on those word clouds. Um, not to dwell on it, because clearly you all understand it, but that to us as a bank, uh, is uh, it's not an area of concern, but it's an area of focus, I think we would say. Um, on the next slide, we can uh, also see some of the other um, impacts that are going to come in on agriculture. And I suppose one thing to mention here, it was interesting to see Peter have these sustainable development goals on his slides. Uh, we've been using them in presentations at Barclays Agriculture probably for five or six years. Uh, these are some of the pressures that are going to come on. The one thing I will um, draw your attention to is uh, goal two, um, zero hunger, which also all of these boxes encapsulate so many different things. And if you actually read across the titles on each box, I think my last calculation of the 17 boxes, 12 or 13 uh, are sort of would have an impact or can be impacted uh, through agriculture. Um, on goal two, which uh, also in, in calls for improved nutrition and sustainable agriculture, uh, the UK is actually sat in 27th place of, I think, about 32 countries being measured. Uh, and that's solely down to the amount of nitrogen and phosphate use uh, on the land. And that's that's what um, that's the sort of position we're in at the minute. So it's not just domestic agricultural policy. It's not just leaving the EU. It's not just elms that is driving us down this more sustainable, uh, trying to reduce diffuse pollution route. It's also things like the UN's sustainable development goals. There is a bit of good news on the horizon, Tim, if you can uh, flick on to my next slide. Um, the good news is, is that um, as a bank, we've been supporting the industry for nearly 300 years, uh, which I did mention at the beginning, but I don't think anybody heard. Um, but the way we lend money is not going to change. You know, we do need to know the purpose and the amount. Uh, we do need to know that you can repay that debt. 99% uh, of the time, that would be through uh, trading, through the business. Occasionally, it can be through asset sale, where there's a, a fixed schedule or a fixed plan to do that. Yeah, we're going to need a bit of insurance, which uh, I suppose in bank speak is, is security. But for me, the, the Campari uh, acronym there, it's the first three, the C, the A, the M, the character, the ability, and the management team involved. Because what we all know being involved in agriculture day in, day out is uh, you can do all the business plans you like. You can do all the strategic plans you like. Uh, then the weather happens or global markets happen uh, or policy changes. And for me, in the coming few years, not only have we always based our decisions, yet yeah, purpose amount, repayment, insurance, but predominantly it's on the character, the ability, and the management team involved in that farm. And I think that is uh, only going to focus even more as we come into this period of huge, huge change. Uh, what happens when we come into a, a period of change? Um, well, we'll find out on the next slide. This is a, a, the Kubler-Ross uh, curve of acceptance. If Tim can click it on, thank you very much. The change curve. Um, some of the words on these uh, is a, is, are a little bit strong, um, but you know we we developing our own domestic agricultural policy. We are going to see a huge amount of changes. The whole emphasis uh, on payments coming into UK agriculture is going to change uh, and be channeled away from area and into elms. And there may well be. There's uh, I still come across a little bit of denial at the minute. Uh, and a little bit of shock every now and then. Um, there is a certain amount of frustration, and I, I, I could almost pick that up on those word clouds uh, in between Peter and I. And then 
depression is a strong word and shouldn't be over overused uh, in the modern world because it's a very serious issue on its own. But you know that that low mood, that lacking of energy, almost that confusion about what step to take next uh, is a very common mode. And certainly I speak to some of our clients who are, are still in that mode at the minute. However, once you get through that change curve and start to get up the other side and you start to investigate and experiment and engage with that change, then you begin to make a few decisions uh, about what you're going to do uh, to your farming business in the future. And then you can integrate them um, into the farming business. Next slide, please. So just remember this. Uh, I've got two slides and then I'll wrap up. Um, there's lots of things in life we worry about. I'm an inherent worrier. Uh, I like to pretend I'm not and, and have an exterior that says I'm not, uh, but I'm an inherent worrier. Um, there are certain things you can influence and all those happen within the ring fence of your farm. And there are lots of things that we should be concerned about uh, in life in general, but there's very little influence you can have on them. Just remember, as we go through this change, it, it, it's the outcome of a situation isn't the scenario. That's just that's just the mood music. It's the backdrop. It's actually the actions that are taken by the different individual farmers and land managers, which define their individual outcome. And that goes back to the Campari character, ability and management. On the last slide, uh, I will uh, wrap up and we'll go through these three steps. Um, Step one sounds really silly, uh, but assess your farming business. What, what does it look like? Where are the areas that are really productive? Where are the areas that perhaps are less productive? What is your cropping? What is your crop rotation? You know, and look at it from every single angle. Step two, really understand the changes that are coming up. Uh, and I'm getting the feeling more and more now that the industry is adopting them and, and realizing what is coming down the path. And then for me, the biggest one is probably draw up that strategic plan. It does not need to be a 78-page uh, Excel spreadsheet with 10,000 words. It can be half a sheet of A4 folded over, discussed with all the business partners and family. And it should be looking at that loss of income. What are you going to do to replace it? Are there options under environmental management? Are there other options, perhaps to do angling and water, to increase uh, and maintain the same income levels? But also what you've got to take into account is the long-term family and business goals. Because for me, sustainability comes in three chunks. Uh, it comes as environmental sustainability. Uh, as a banker uh, and a former business consultant, it comes in financial sustainability. But also, we've got to remember that at the heart of the vast majority of farming businesses in the UK is usually a family and an awful lot of history. So there has to be a huge degree of family uh, sustainability built in. Uh, with that, Tim... I will hand back to you and we can do some Q&A. Fantastic. Thank you, Oliver. Um, great that you got back on with your audio. That was a great relief. Um, Andy, I'm going to hand over to you to start the Q&A. Great. Thank you very much. And, um, and, and everybody, um, please do kind of fire any more questions into the Q&A box because I'll, I'll start off with a couple of general questions uh, and then I'll pick out some from, from that Q&A. So I, one of the things that really struck me in both presentations and then in the word clouds um, particularly was about the kind of volatility and, and managing volatility and I guess if we take climate change as, um, as an element of that volatility you know you're both kind of at the top level of, of big organizations and you've got the kind of the knowledge and the resources to help understand and implement kind of changes driven by by things like climate change what kind of advice would you give to to land managers who may not have those kind of resources uh, peter i'll come to you first well obviously i get i guess i'm not a farmer um so i mean I, i'm i'll give some perspectives from uh, running running a water company and there might be some some relevance and, and read across to this we are facing some of the extreme uh, uncertainties that farmers are facing and climate change came up on, on the word cloud earlier on writ large. We've got our own version of what happens to um, subsidies and income to a water company as well to play with, as well as lots of other dimensions that we have to consider. And one of the things that we do, which I think serves us really well, is to think not about exactly how the future will be, but more about how it potentially could be. 
And so what, what do I mean by that? I mean, in, who, who can actually work out and predict exactly what the situation is going to be like in five or six years' time? Um, I, I don't suppose anybody will get it right. What you can do is think about, well, what are some plausible scenarios? What are some plausible ways it could look? And um, we've done this a lot uh, together, actually, with farming and power, thinking about water for the future. So what might happen to power and power's demand for water? What might happen to agricultural demand for water? What might happen to public water supply demand for water? And what are some scenarios of that looking, looking into the future? And then the, the benefit of doing that is you then think about, and what am I, what am I going to do now? And what are the things, if you like, that are no regret in all of those different scenarios? And what are the sort of options I can take along the way and sort of have a, a more sort of adaptable um, strategy as you, as you go through? It's, it's served, that approach has served us very well because whilst we tend to operate in, in probably different time scales, probably to, to lots of the people on, on the call um, with, our, with our planning, uh, there has been an awful lot of change and, and that scenario based thinking has has worked really well for us. Great. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Oliver, have you got kind of any more thoughts to add to that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, volatility um, is, is nothing new. Um, and I know uh, from personal experience, uh, experience of friends and family involved in farming, um, <laughs> On occasion, given the isolated nature of the industry, it can feel like it, it, it's just agriculture that's being chased down the road uh, of climate change, emissions and what have you. Uh, I can assure you, uh, as Peter's demonstrated uh, through angling water, it's something they've been thinking about for a good few years. Uh, I can assure you that as a bank, we are giving it serious consideration as to you know, the, the pressures that climate change and legislation change are going to put on us in the coming few years. Um, but I think for me, it, 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 the way you counteract volatility is by giving yourself stability. So it is about having a vision of the future, having that strategic plan. Yeah, it's going to change and it's not going to be easy and you're not going to deliver X and Y on the exact date. We all know that. But actually having a direction is the important thing. Now, some farmers I know have been planning for the loss of subsidy, for example, probably for six or eight years now, some even as long as 10 or 15 uh, a couple of farming friends. Uh, it's not an easy route to go down. Um, it's it's a challenge, that's for sure. Uh, but I think agriculture is in a very fortunate position, given that uh, you know we have got elms on the back of it uh, to help us into that transition period. So there are going to be some payments, um, but we've also got till 2028 to really get in line and ready for BPS reductions. Um, so I, that is the biggest challenge at the moment in the immediate. Um, the immediate sort of five years is to get get to bit, get our farming businesses across the UK into a position where lots of BPS uh, and they're going to survive. Uh, and then running parallel to that and probably a bit delayed uh, is going to be the sort of the, the climate change challenge. But now is the time to be thinking about it. You know, I'd be looking at carbon audits. I'd be looking for a footmark as to where I am now. Uh, and, and as I said, just looking at the farm business top to toe, what can I do to improve? Okay, fantastic. Now I'm going to take a few of the questions from the, the Q&A. Um, so uh, first, so um, Oliver, coming to you, but I think there's there's some input from you as well, Peter, on this one. So the, the question is, can a farm level national shift to regenerative agriculture be facilitated by Barclays? But I would equally think, can that be facilitated by, um, by angling water and the water sector as well, Peter? So Oliver, if I come to you first, and then I'll, I'll come to Peter. Excellent. I, I take it by facilitated, they mean funded. Um, the, um, hey, there's an awful lot of questions um, uh, out there at the moment. Regenerative, I, I say it a lot, and I'm sorry if, if people uh, who've sort of dialed in and tuned in uh, have heard it before, because uh, if they'd heard me speak before, they will have heard it before. Uh, the way we combat climate change, diffuse pollution, uh, as well as uh, efficiency and productivity in UK agriculture is going to be a jigsaw. And it's, it's, it's not even one of those sort of 500-piece ones you have on a wet holiday in the UK. This is a almost a 10,000-piece jigsaw that all needs to sit together. And it is going to be about collaboration. It is going to be about working together with Angling Water and you know, all the other water companies and all the other stakeholders in the rural economy. Um, 
There is a place for regenerative, regenerative agriculture, which I wish someone had renamed because I really struggle to say it. Uh, there is a huge place for regenerative agriculture. But again, it's going to be on a sort of sliding scale. I believe we're about to enter a period where nearly all land management will end up going down some form of regenerative route. Um, you know, whether that's to the the absolute extreme of it, uh, regenerative agriculture, or whether that's just changes to soil management, cropping uh, rotations, and how the land is actually, you know, whether it's ploughed, mint till, you know, there's, there's all sorts of degrees, isn't there? So um, certainly we have clients who are doing regenerative agriculture, uh, and uh, if they're profitable and want to borrow money, we can facilitate that. And, and turning to you, Peter, there's quite a few questions in, in the, both the chat and the, and the Q&A, specifically asking about angling water and, and you know how can we work collaboratively or how can land managers and farmers work collaboratively with us on delivering some of this do you, do you want to kind of give your thoughts on those sure i, I mean I, I guess the the first point would be uh in the presentation I, I gave some examples of where we've got some real successes and the slug it out metaldehyde the way in which we've worked at catchment levels with uh, many, many farmers and many farms at le leading to a, a joint success is, is a great example of, of how it can be done. Um, the, the, some of the questions that are coming through about, well, you know, for example, for Anglian, you know, are we going to have to look at offsetting some of our carbon footprint to get to net zero by 2030? Um, now, the answer to that is yes, we are. And so is every other water company uh, across across the industry. And that's after we've done all of the things that you should expect us to do, which is reduce our own carbon footprint, you know, genuinely reducing carbon and then offsetting it ourselves with uh, renewables. We have still got a residual, uh, a residual gap there across the industry as a whole. Now, that is an opportunity, actually, I think, for farming. And what I think is going to happen here, actually, is that the uh, availability of decent quality long term um, so genuinely long-term offsets is going to be too small for the demand. Um, we are we as Anglian are worried about it now, and it's actually what's kind of stimulated us to start working and thinking about this thing in our own region. Because the last thing we want to do is is get caught in you know, towards 2030 saying, "Oh, well, there's the only markets here to do in this is some sort of cheap scheme in in you know somewhere else in the world, which we can't have confidence in." What we want to do, if we, are gonna, if we have to offset um, some of this carbon and you know, have a decent sequestration scheme, is know it's there, be able to feel and touch it, have confidence in it, know it will survive. It isn't a short um, rubbish scheme, which is you know, frankly gonna be gone in a couple of weeks time. Um, and, and it's the big and for us, and we wanna uh, get other things from it as well. We want to see increase in biodiversity and, and uh, improvements in natural habitat and, and actually, because of where we are, we're prepared to pay for that because we need to do that, you know, that, so, and we are not unique. So the reason we've got that pilot going is to say, well, let's, let's not wait for elms to appear and under, let's see if we can start crafting some of this stuff. Let's start, see if we can develop a market around this. Uh, we're certainly up for it because uh, we don't want to wait um, to 2030 and then, and then find out that everybody's on the bandwagon. And I think there's great opportunities here for for, uh, for land managers. Yeah, and, and there are a couple of questions further down in the in the Q and A's asking specifically about how they get in touch with with Anglian and have conversations about this and 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 what some of the specifics might be. What I would say to that is stay in touch with this network. So don't just listen to this seminar and go away. Be part of the network because we'll be you know deeply involved with it, and that's your best opportunity to have some deeper conversations. Um, Oliver, I'm very conscious of time, but I'm going to fire one at you because I think it's really pertinent to what we're talking about in terms of the business planning at the farm level. Um, the question is, what are your, what are the common strengths of the top farm businesses that you work with? Um, okay, good question. Good question. Um, for me, uh, it, it, sounding a bit dull and repetitive, uh, it is, it's the management style. Um, there's, if you're running a business, you can never immerse your head in the sand and ignore what's going on around you. You've got to keep your head up and looking around you. So for me, um, you know, it's it's people who are aware of the challenges. Um, for us, a positive conversation is a client ringing us up and saying, this is the impact of BPS reductions on my farm business. 
I'm going to try this, 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 and this, or we're going to cut this, this, and this out. Uh, you know, that's a really positive conversation. It's a tough conversation, uh, and it's a hard conversation, uh, but it's much better than us uh, sadly having to ring clients, which I know we'll end up doing, come into 2023, 24, and say, right, there's a bit of pressure on this account now. What are you doing about BPS reductions? So it's having that vision uh, and recognizing what's coming down the track. Um, I, I always say, if you look at the probably the, the top 10% managed farm businesses in our book, uh, I think I could put those managers in just about any business. Uh, not Anglian Water, Peter, of course, uh, but I could put them in just about any business and they would run it. And it's about that laser focus all the time. You know, you can't have an off day. Uh, it's like a, a, a top class sportsman. You have an off day, you get dropped. Uh, you know, uh, if, if, in business, it's laser focus all the time. And then I think that the sort of last one I would comment on is um, cheesy as it sounds. Uh, one of your greatest strengths is knowing what your weaknesses are. You know, if you if you, uh, one of the best dairy farmers I know confesses that he doesn't like milking cows, can't stand it. So his, when he took over from his father, the first thing he did was increase the herd size so much that he could justify bringing a, a cowman in to milk the cows because he didn't like it. He also says he's not very good at it. Uh, you know, just recognizing that uh, is brilliant. You know, if, you, if you're not skilled at doing the accounts, what do we all do? We get an accountant in. There's, there's nothing, nothing wrong with looking at the farming business and saying, actually, I'm not a great tractor driver. Or I'm not a great mechanic or I'm not a great, you know, uh, you know, nutrient budgeter, whatever it is. And getting someone in or finding someone in the family who can do it properly, because there's nothing worse than someone attempting to do a job and doing it badly. Great. That's, that's a fantastic one to, to finish the questions on. Uh, and I think, you know, as we said at the beginning, what we really want to do is this to become a, a network and, a, and an ongoing kind of learning opportunity. And many of the questions that are in that chat, I think, will be explored and can be answered if you stay with us over the next six weeks and then kind of stay with that learning kind of uh, live learning opportunity after that. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll end the Q&A there. Tim, I'll hand back to you and we'll, we'll wrap up. Great. Well, thank you both, Peter and Oliver and Andy. Thank you for chairing. What a great session that was to kick us off. And as Andy said, there's a lot of ongoing programs that are going to be coming after this. So keep an eye out on our website. Uh, Mark is just about to send through the link for the upcoming uh, episodes and the other interviews with that we're doing. But I think probably we'll wrap up there. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for your time. It's now half past. Have a wonderful Easter weekend. Um, and we greatly look forward to seeing you next week and hopefully have, hopefully have you join our online community, which we're going to launch next week. So we'll be sending out comms on that. So thank you, everyone. We look forward to the next chatting and um, have a great week weekend.